for asking me here today. It's absolutely a delight to be here and to share uh, my grant. This is my first grant from the NIH that I received in 1995, so it's now in its 23rd continuous year of funding, and I'm contemplating its future. Uh, being a dean and being a researcher don't always go hand in hand. It's very hard, but we will see. So today I would like to go through a history of how we did genetic research in mid-1990s to where we are today and currently where we're working right now in the hypergen study. When I'm presenting, I like to get questions. You know, this is a phenotype that a lot of people may not know anything about, the size of the heart and why it's important. So if there's anything confusing, please raise your hand and ask me, and I'd rather you stay with me than be confused. So I'm open to questions. All right, so here we go. Um, so left ventricular hypertrophy is a really interesting and important phenotype. I got interested in this phenotype when I was working as a clinical research nurse. Um, as Anna said, I graduated from nursing in 1981, and I worked in the field from 81 to 86, and then discovered clinical research at the VA hospital in Tampa. And what fascinated me about LV hypertrophy, its thickening of the muscle of the left ventricle typically in the context of hypertension, is that there was tremendous variability in my individual patients who were undergoing clinical trials of antihypertensive agents in how their heart hypertrophied. Some people would have very high levels of blood pressure, have no LVH. Other people would have not very high blood pressure and, not, and have very high values of LVH. And it tended to be very different by ethnicity with African Americans having a much worse um, thickening of the left ventricle wall and also a narrowing of the left ventricular internal diameter, the sort of inner part of your heart that relaxes and lets blood in before the contraction that um, fuels blood going throughout your body. So I got really interested at that point as a clinical research nurse and, and that was the subject of my first R01. So traditionally, hypertrophy has simply been thought to be a compensatory mechanism in reaction to an increased load on the heart from hypertension. When you have hypertension, your vessels constrict, your heart is pumping harder against that restriction or constriction in the vessels. It increases wall stress um, also. So I've already told you there's just considerable variability in LV mass even across um, equal levels of blood pressure. And about the time I was doing my master's thesis, a paper came out from the Framingham Heart Study that actually showed that normotensive individuals with higher levels of LV mass went on to develop hypertension. So it may be a chicken and egg phenomenon, and, and it could be that there are genes that predispose to hypertrophy that then lead to hypertension. And we know from animal models that there, you know, Hearts have been a, a study of, of the hyper, spontaneously hypertensive rat for years, and we knew that there was a very strong genetic component to hypertrophy in the rat models. So this is um, why hypertrophy is important to me. I'm an epidemiologist. Epidemiologists study epidemics, and LV hypertrophy is actually an epidemic in the general population. What do I mean by an epidemic? about 16 to 18% of the Framingham Heart Study population has LV hypertrophy, and it approaches almost one in two of every hypertensive person. Amongst African Americans, LV hypertrophy and hypertensive heart disease is actually the major cause of death from heart disease. African Americans have twice the risk as European Americans, and as I've said here, it's associated with multiple forms of cardiovascular disease, so if we look at LVH, there are three different buckets of, of outcomes that are associated with hypertrophy. The first is ischemia. Uh, the second is arrhythmias that can lead to sudden death. Of course, ischemia can lead to acute ischemic events like myocardial infarction. And then ventricular dysfunction, even in the absence of ischemic events, um, you can get systolic and diastolic heart failure from LV hypertrophy. <coughs> So how do we measure this epidemiologically? Um, there's a tool that's been out for many, many years called echocardiography. More recently, there have been advances in the methodology in echo. You know, sadly, our techniques in the 1990s were based on 
um, measurement simply of the cross-section of the left ventricle. And this is the internal diameter of the heart. And we measured the posterior wall and the interventricular septum. And the LV mass is calculated um, using a cubic formula here, um, where we multiply by the specific gravity of mass. And this was modeled against necropsied LV mass um, from echoes done um, in people who had died and, and then uh, adjusted or, or compared to their uh, heart size. So those are the phenotypes. So now I'm going to run through what we did. Yes, sir? What is an exercise-induced hypertrophic anemia? So it's interesting that um, exercise-induced hypertrophy uh, tends to get um, enlargement of the wall, but also instead of enlarge or, or a constriction of in the internal diameter, the whole heart enlarges. So you, functionally, it's a very functional heart that's responded to this increased workload needed from exercise. But you don't get the fibrosis and you don't get the ischemic or... or um, Do you get those measurements that you put up before in an exercise person with them, like a, you know, the basketball players or the bicyclists who have huge hearts and pulses of 38? <laughs> Yes, um, so, but their heart would, their, functionally they would be normal, but their heart size would be larger. But the internal diameter is what's important. So when you're, when you're getting hypertensive heart disease, for instance, your heart muscle cannot relax. So what's important in an exercise, when you're heavily exercising, when your heart goes in diastole, your heart needs to fill so that when it contracts, you can get blood out um, so you get oxygen to the rest of your body to do your exercise. So what happens in exercise is the heart stays compliant, it relaxes, you get a big stroke volume when the, the heart um, contracts. All right, so let's run through my first R01. And this will take us back a while. Now back in the day, in 1994, when I started my career as a genetic epidemiologist, in order to conduct genetic work, which was incredibly expensive at the time. Um, this was prior to the completion of the Human Genome Project, and it required us to get families. Families are very hard to recruit um, because you not only have to get the probe in, but you have to entice all of their family members. In the case of Hypergen, we had something called an affected SID pair design. So that meant we had to have a probe in with hypertension, and then at least one other family member with hypertension before the age of onset of 60 in order to recruit the family. And where we were recruiting from, I was in Minnesota at the time, and my mentor turned the study over to me as PI, uh, the parent study, the U01. Only 4.5% of the atherosclerosis risk in communities cohort in Minnesota qualified for my study. So it really represents familial extreme form of hypertension. So the first thing we had to do in my R01 was show that the trait was heritable. So we'd shown from prior twin studies that LV mass itself was a highly heritable trait. And this is one of our first papers published way back in 2001 that looked at the heritability of LV mass in hypergen. And it, we separated out different um, SIB types, brother, sister, brother, brother, and sister, sister, because you know, size and gender can play such an important role in heart size, so we wanted to make sure that the correlations were consistent. What's interesting is the African Americans here are in the tall, sort of bluish bars, the Caucasians are in the red bars, and you see in every kind of pair, the heritability is much greater, the sibling correlation, in the African Americans and in the whites, and the overall composite of those, um, taking a, away the spousal correlations adjusted for that piece, the heritability estimates were 70% in blacks. So that means that 70% of the between individual differences in hypertrophy or LV mass could be explained on, on the basis of familial, familial relationships. So this is back in 1994. So what were we doing then at the time to discover genes? So these are the kinds of questions that we could ask from a genetics perspective. 
Where in the genome is the gene likely to lie? And to do that, our method then was linkage analysis. And then once we could identify linkage, um, we might ask where are the common genetic variants that might be causative, and there we would move at the, that point to regional um, areas of association. And then now we've moved into the area now of what rare genetic variants um, might be causative. And then where we are currently working now in hypergen is can we functionally validate the effects of, of those genes. So that's just the general historical perspective of how we go after genes. So this is our hypergen pedigree structure. Um, this was in the day when we were doing um, microsatellite marker typing. So we had 400 markers across the genome that were highly repetitive repeat markers called microsatellite markers that were extremely hetero, with a lot of heterogeneity. So you, you, you could really define within a family where um, uh, genetic markers were being inherited. So when these are the sibs, we later recruited the offspring of the sibs. So we have two generations, lots of avuncular um, uncle, cousin, aunt, cousin pairs in our sample. All right, so for finding genes then, we started with our linkage scan. Our next step would be fine mapping, where we would take that linkage peak, add lots more either microsatellite markers or single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are markers with just one variant. Or, and then we would follow that up with additional association analyses and then work towards functional assays. So I'm gonna be running through this whole paradigm today. Now this was our first um, analysis, these data were published I think in 2005, where we looked for linkage for a variety of our heart functional and um, structural traits. So left ventricular mass is that composite mat, um, cubic formula I showed you before, indexed to body size. Relative wall thickness is this measure that estimates how concentric hypertrophy is. Remember African Americans have a much a more concentric form of hypertrophy. These two measures are, are estimates of diastolic function. Um, this is arterial stiffness, which is measuring the stiffness in the arteries. Um, aortic root diameter, um, so the structure of the aortic root, the, the, the diameter of that. And these two, this one, mid-wall shortening, um, is an estimate of the systolic function. So what we, you'll notice here that our highest score was below three. Now in the day, three was considered significant for genome-wide linkage analysis. Actually, we had even higher thresholds, but we weren't even getting to three. Now we're in the, in the fourth year of our grant, and we have to do something. So what do you do in the absence of statistical significance? You start thinking, right? So one of the things we were very excited about, about chromosome four, was that there were many of these different correlated echocardiographic traits all mapping to this very broad region between 100 and 200 centimorgans in Caucasians. And we also saw some evidence of a departure um, in African Americans. So because it was, they were both segregating on, on chromosome four, generally the same region, and many traits were mapping to the same region, we decided to pursue this region very aggressively. So because we didn't have money to pursue the 400 genes or so that were known at that time in that region, we decided to validate in another system. So I was working with actually um, the Medical College of Wisconsin, who was part of the family blood pressure program with me at that time, and they had rat models of hypertension, and they were doing the, actually creating the rat genome and homology mapping the rat genome to the human genome. Um, that work was being done by Howard Jacob. So Howard and I worked together to say, where in the human chromosome four is the rat chromosome in your models, and is there evidence of linkage in the rat for this same region on chromosome four in the human? And the answer was actually, um, yes, yeah, so this is Rat chromosome two, the homology region for rat for human chromosome four, and we had a significant log score in the rat over four. So we felt that we had validated the region. So then, that wasn't enough because it's still a huge region, 
right? And, and back then, you know, gen genotyping was hundreds of thousands of dollars to characterize a region. So then we decided to, again, use our head. So we went through the literature and pulled out every reference to LVH or hypertension in the rat, the mouse, and the human, and created this Venn diagram. So where are we seeing consistency in at least two of those three systems? And from that, we identified these five genes carboxypeptidase, interleukin-15, secreted frizzled protein-2, neuropeptide Y, two different receptors um, on chromosome 4. Now, what's interesting is then we went in and sequenced each of these genes, and then we identified all of the variants, and we tested them for association. So what's really fascinating to me, looking back, you know, 20 years later, is doing this approach, we were able to identify significant associations with all five of those genes with our echo traits, which, you know, back in the day, it's, it's hard. Now that we have so much genetic data, it's hard to imagine that this is unusual. Um, but it was like shooting into a haystack to pull out a needle back in the day when we started this work. So we were really thrilled and delighted that we found these. Now, have they held up over the last 20 years. So um, let me talk a little bit before I get there about one of the more exciting findings. So neuropeptide Y is a receptor. Um, it's a G protein coupling receptor um, and it's expressed in ventricular cardiomyocytes um, and also prejunction on sympathetic nerves. This is important. Um, and it appears to attenuate the, the response from the autonomic nervous system. So it seems to be a protective factor in theory for LVH. So these are the results from our NPY analysis for two of our traits, the, the wall thickness of the outside wall of the heart and the relative wall thickness of the heart. Um, and these were our three um, common variants. And these are relative wall thickness and posterior wall thickness. These are the three SNFs. What you'll see is that in African Americans, after we adjusted for things like body size and gender, um, this particular variant seemed to be important in terms of association. At MCW, I told you they were very good with rats at MCW and doing the rat genome. They also had a transgenic neuropeptide Y rat model. And this transgenic rat was um, upregulated neuropeptide Y. And when they upregulated the neuropeptide Y in this rat, this transgenic, they had reduced blood pressure, reduced catecholamines, um, re diminished sensitivity to behavioral stress and seizures, all of, and increased longevity. I'm sure we would all like something that would upregulate our MPY receptors because those are all good things to happen. Um, in terms of blood pressure. And the results suggested that there, this functions as an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it attenuates or protects against that nausea, noxious effect of the adrenergic stimulation. It would be like if you were running, being chased by a tiger, you know, and threatened with your life and your cortisol is going like crazy, you know, this neuropeptide Y receptor seemed to protect you against that no noxious problem. So these data um, represent some of the basic studies that were done. This is, you can't see it, but this is the LV area mapped from these three animals. So this is the, the sham rat of the, the non-neuropeptide um, Y rat. This is called the one kidney, one clip model. So they go in and clip the kidney to make the rat hypertensive. And when they do that, the heart size goes up. Um, they give the agonist to that, um, to the to neuropeptide Y, and it completely attenuates that whole hypertrophic response in the one kidney, one clip model. Um, and you can see over time that the one kidney, one clip model makes, makes heart size go up, posterior wall thickness but not in the, in the, uh, the one kidney, one clip um, rat with the, the marker that goes against neuropeptide Y. Sorry, what's one kidney, one clip? Okay, so in the rat, to induce hypertension, 
They go in, they clip the kidney. They clip, they just clip it. So they tie a ligature around the renal artery. So you get hypertension. And this, this is the agonist to neuropeptide Y. So um, it's, it's, it's taking away its effect. So since that time, um, there have been other papers that have uh, supported our finding in neuropeptide Y. This is one that looked at cardiac metabolomic, meta cardiac metabolic remodeling. Um, and they found that if you, tr and if you had cardiac pressure overload and you pretreated with this um, TMZ, you reversed that acute metabolic disturbance through the neuropeptide Y system. So it seems to still be important. It seems to be important um, in that the, the combination or interaction between the left ventricle and that neurotransmitter um, prejunction of, of the nerv nervous system. So the second gene that we found that has held up over time is that secreted frizzled protein 2. Um, and so this is another paper recently published in 2016 um, that showed that cardiac fibroblast lacking PMCA4, which is a plasma memory calcium, produce higher levels of this secreted um, related protein 2, which inhibits the hypertrophic response in neighboring cardiomyocytes. So the story is still to be told whether any of these are druggable targets, um, but given, again, I'm, I like LVH as a phenotype because it, A, it's common, and B, it's associated with really profound cardiovascular consequences. And interestingly, unlike any phenotype that we've, we've discovered, for instance, in the Framingham study, all of the others have a drug target. Blood pressure, lipids, I'm smoking to some extent, um, but LVH, which was one of the most potent of the risk factors identified in the first Framingham paper, there's still not one druggable target for LVH specifically. So it is an area where there's a lot of interest. All right, so that was the end of my linkage days. So at the uh, third renewal of my R01, we were looking for the next thing to do. Now in 2007, um, just 11 years ago, Science Magazine called Genome-Wide Association Studies the breakthrough of the year. And it's hard to believe that was just 11 years ago, um, but that was the onslaught of all of these Genome-Wide Association Studies. So we in Hypergen uh, were funded to do Genome-Wide Association in our cohort. So uh, back in the, the day when these studies were being contemplated, we had to propose multi-stage design. Does anyone know why, who's not a statistical geneticist, why we did multi-stage designs? So because these SNP panels, back then we were very excited because we had 872,000 SNPs on our array. You're doing 872,000 statistical tests. So you have to correct for that. Now, correcting for it when you have a smaller sample may throw out the baby with the bathwater. So a different and alternative strategy was to do what they called multi-stage designs. So here you would take a, uh, the full platform, investigate it, you would sift out your top findings and replicate them in a second stage, sift out the findings again that held up over time and replicate again. Um, so there were multi-stage designs, and all of that was intended to reduce the false positive burden. Um, and, and actually, from a scientific perspective, to ensure validity of the finding. So we had a multi-stage design. Now we, in Hypergen, uh, we were focusing exclusively on Af our African-American siblings. Uh, we had a partner study called Genoa, who was part of the Family Blood Pressure Program, who also um, recruited African Americans from Jackson. And then we had our uh, Caucasian sample of hypertensive SIDS in the Hypergen study. Um, so we, in the white sample, 
use the cheaper array um, because back then these things cost about, I'm thinking they were seven or eight hundred dollars per array, believe it or not, now they're 30. So um, we had to, to balance what we could do. With whites, all of the arrays had been built in Caucasian samples primarily, so we felt more confident that we could use that array in white. So anyway, that's why they were different sizes. So I wanted to just give you a, 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 a sampling of what hypergen looks like. So the average age of our African Americans was 45. Um, we had more females than males, which is very typical in, in studies of African Americans. About 17% were diabetic. They were a very heavy group. So this is the average BMI, the average BMI, and this is 1994, like 20 years ago. Um, their, their BMI was over obese, so they were already at 33. Um, their blood pressures don't look too bad. Again, most of them were on two or more medications, so these were their blood pressures on medication. Um, they were all uh, hypertensive. Uh, some of the offspring were not hypertensive, but all of the proband generation, their siblings were. About one in four had hypertrophy. Now, that was our stage one. Stage two sample, notice the age here, it's 45, and notice LV hypertrophy, 25. When we went into our second stage, still African Americans, the mean age is almost 20 years older. They're about 63 on average. They're about equally fat as, as compared to hypergen, um, but they had much less hypertrophy. And this is a finding consistent with um, Jackson Heart Study and other studies in Jackson, they seem to ha have less hypertrophy there. Our, our whites resembled more, more the hypergen sample. They were about age 50, again, less, less hypertrophy, about 15%. So here was our best finding uh, in our genome-wide association study, and this is uh, SNP RS1436109. And this was our first stage, so in two of our Three of our traits, we had evidence for wall thicknesses. This is the interventricular septum that divides your right and left ventricle, the posterior wall thickness, um, and then that relative wall thickness were reached the statistical significant threshold in our stage one. So we took this SNP to Genoa and asked the same question. We found um, evidence. Again, we don't have to correct for multiple testing here. We're test doing one test, um, 10 to the minus second in the comparable um, area. So we submitted the paper and claimed a win. And the editors came back and said, um, you, you need another sample. So, you know, and in this time at period, this is, was published in 2011 in CERC Research, and this time period, it was interesting because no one would say you could replicate in another ethnic group. That's what I was going to ask. But circulation research that you will replicate in another ethnic group, and if it doesn't replicate, I guess we would not have been published. What's interesting is that in whites, the associations are in the other traits. So while wall thicknesses mattered in African Americans, in the Caucasian samples, it was um, relative wall thickness and the internal diameter of the heart. So whites tend to have a larger internal diameter and when they have hypertrophy, their, their internal diameter grows, but in blacks it shrinks. So it's, it's interesting, um, so this particular finding was published in Circulation Research. And now let's look at the RS1436109. So this is the actual um, SNP plot. So each of these dots represents a SNP. If they're red, that means that they're tightly linked to the, the SNP that is next to them. And this is the actual 1436109. <coughs> so it's on chromosome 11. And this is the in CAM1 gene. It's a neural adhesion molecule 1. And what you see is that there's this long distance here. 
And all of this is a promoter region. So it, it was, when genes are in a promoter region, it means they're probably controlling expression. We put the NCAM into what's called an ingenuity pathway analysis, and you'll see more of these slides later. So this is NCAM1 in the center. So all of the red genes here that are in this circle are all genes that are also related to NCAM and expressed in cardiac tissue. So it seems to be clearly a gene um, that's important in cardiac tissue. In the literature, we had found a study um, that had looked at right ventricular hypertrophy. Um, this was a study by Kimura that was published in 2007. And what's interesting is that it appears that NCHEM1 is one of what's called the fetal programming genes. So the fetal programming is a set of genes that turns on growth of the ventricle and that growth happens through the neonatal period and then gets, gets turned off. So you're not adding, you're not growing the ventricle. Your heart size will increase, but the cardiomyocytes um, do not. So monocrotaline is something that um, turns on that process. It's a drug that turns that on. So here they're looking at the the top is the immunofluorescent staining for this um, immature form of, called PSA NCAM, an immature form of NCAM. And this is saying, this is the control. When they give the monocrotaline, you see lots of upregulation of the expression of NCAM. And this is almost equivalent to the needle natal um, expression of NCAM. Um, these are also Western blots just showing how the protein gets turned on. So it appears to be something important in terms of turning on that fetal programming again. And we've always thought in this area of hypertrophy that there's something that turns that mechanism on that, that leads to hypertrophy. Since we've done that GWAS, there have been other um, studies that have come back and shown the importance of NCAM. Again, I don't know if it's, if it's yet a druggable target, but it, is, it does hold some hope. Um, so, for some reason, what's, my computer's asking me what's on my mind. <laughs> and I don't have my glasses on, so I don't know exactly how to get rid of it. I, I found it, cancel. Tell it. I think no. Maybe I can use this. Nope, it's frozen. <laughs> genome sequence so many more ethnic groups and because we can now better estimate um, the haplotypes and know what the linkage equilibrium is between a, a, a SNP on a GWAS platform, I think our ability to do that is better. Gustavo, would you agree or not? You yeah, I mean, I, I think me. if you validate in, a, in another ethnic group, that's a great finding because it's, uh, it means that the genes have similar effects. I would interpret that as the gene having similar effects uh, in, across ethnic groups, which is, is great. So, uh, to me, if you are able to validate across ethnic groups, that's yeah. even stronger. Yeah. So I don't know what is going now. Yeah. <laughs> so. And if it's possible also that you are finding a QTL that's not very close to a QTL. Because maybe the signal was a SNP that is close to a QTL, but it's not a QTL. And the LD block is breaking in the other ethnicities. So, so. 
All right, we'll see if this works. It did, okay. Um, so I'm not gonna bore you with more NCAN, but I do have hope for this gene. Uh, as I said, we need a druggable target for LVH. So the limitations of genome-wide association studies, um, they still only genotype about 1.1% of the genome. It's dependent on relatively common variants, and it demands very large sample sizes, especially for common phenotypes, like the blood pressure, GWAS, that uh, the last one had 200, over 200,000 individuals in it. You know, it, it requires large samples. So the new move and my last iteration of the hyper, and maybe the last of all iterations of the hypergen grant, is that moving into um, rare variant analysis. So we are working now doing, uh, as part of the R01, we're doing whole exome sequencing, and that's the results I'm going to present today. Uh, we also now have whole genome sequence available, too, through the TopNet project with NHLBI. All right, so whole genome sequencing has become affordable for many studies and in clinical testing. In fact, at UK, we've set up whole exome sequencing, um, specifically in the cancer area and in the cardiovascular area uh, for um, not only prognos prognosticating uh, treatment decisions, but also for um, understanding cardiomyopathies and other inherited cardiovascular traits. It's very powerful for the study of rare Mendelian diseases, and the purpose here is really not to evaluate those common SNPs, but really to look at the rare. The pros are that you can, if you have a rare disease that's traveling in a family, it it's, it's, can be done with small sample sizes, but that assumes that you have a very strong Mendelian and rare disease. And it may be adaptation in family-based designs. Um, because you can track um, through pedigrees that particular rare variant. So it's done whole sequencing studies, selectively assay the protein coding part of the genome called exons on all chromosomes to find polymorphisms that are both rare and common. Um, we use the exome capture roche nimblegen um, CAP-EZ with paired Eden sequencing using Illumina high seq sequencing instruments. And all of our sequencing work was done by Debbie Nickerson at Wa University of Washington. So this is just um, comparison of the pipeline that you have to create for GWAS, which is much more simple, versus exome. So you have to annotate. We get a lot of new variants that are discovered. Um, we have about 200,000 variants that are detected for every um, for, for our study, uh, we're looking at minor little frequencies, definitely less than 5%. We have to, to bend genes in order to understand, um, because you're doing about 26,000 genes across the genome, um, <clears throat> you have to utilize gene pathways and regulatory elements in order to, to do your testing. And instead of testing a single variant test, as before in GWAS, you're looking at a cumulative effect using a gene-based based method, and these are called burden or collapsing test or variance components tests. Um, and most of the work we've done has been executed in something called sequence kernel association test or SCAT. The multiple testing burden is a little less than what we had in GWAS um, for 1.5 million SNPs, which was bigger than what we used in hypergen. It's 10 to the minus 8. For exome, it's about 10 to the minus 6. All right, so we hypothesized in, in hypergen that there was a combination of rare and uh, common functional coding variants uh, in, a in about five genes. So we hypothesized this as part of the grant. Why did we say five genes? We were working with our basic science laboratory again at MCW and they could afford to do five genes. So that led our hypothesis to five genes. So we had 1,434 African Americans who were sequenced with a mean coverage of 20x. Um, and we found in our sample 199,000 missense mutations, about 3,400 stop gains, and 139 stop loss mutations. And we used Anivar to capture the functional prediction scores and classifications. 
All right, so these, for those of you who are statistically minded, the SCAT framework has a general framework, an optimal framework that reports optimal results from the burden and the SCAT test, and it has the rare and common, which incorporates both rare and common variants in the analysis. Um, it aggregates associations between variants and phenotypes through a kernel matrix. It gets individual score test statistics of SNPs in a set and efficiently computes the SNP set level p-values. The good thing about SCAD is it's very robust to different directions of effects of individual variants, and you can adjust for covari covariance. So in our analysis, we've adjusted for age, sex, recruitment center, and principal components for ancestry. Even though we're a family-based study, we did it anyway because reviewers will ask you to do it, and we adjusted for kinship. And our Bonferroni correction level was 10 to the minus 6. All right, so we talked a little bit about hypergen already, so I'm going to um, skip through this slide and get right to where we are now and how we picked genes. So these are, in this list is our trait, and this list is the gene name, uh, this is our total wear SNP count, and the various types of um, key values that we got from the three different types of SCAT runs. So our best finding was for this gene called PDE12, um, and we also had um, other interesting findings. We pulled out SLC27A6, as you'll see in a minute, for different reasons. So how do you move then? So the same problem I faced back in the day with linkage, when I had this huge region with three to 400 genes, is we had probably 24 genes that had a p-value of 10 to the minus 6. We could test five genes, because that's what we had money to do. So we published a paper about three years ago in Frontiers of Genetics that looked at a scoring method that we developed um, in a pilot study we did of hypergen trios. And the scoring method we've, we've attempted now to replicate, but we've added a little bit to it so that we can score these various different genes listed on that graph, that table before, and decide what to pursue. So we created this point system. So first we said if it's a structural trait, structural traits are easier to measure, so they're more robust from a phenotyping perspective, it would get a point. If there was broad cardiac function for the gene in the literature, it would get a point. And we have a really unique element to our study, which is that we have, from the hypergen sample, a U01 that collected and grew iPS-induced pluripotent stem cells and a laboratory in Wisconsin that converted them to cardiomyocytes. So we have, from hypergen individuals, our own cardiomyocytes. So we've got African Americans in the sample, and cardiomyocytes from 120 of them that have been grown um, for testing. So we're using those iPSCs to help us. So if we get expression of the gene using RNA-seq methods in those cardiomyocytes, then that gets a point. We also added um, having associations with what, more than one echo trait, just like we did in the linkage study. You know, we saw lots of different echo traits pointing to chromosome 4. We added that into our scoring system. If it was a loss of function mutation, we added that. And if there was reference to hyper, hypertrophy or cardiomyocytes in the literature, we added that. And if there was a mix of common and rare variants contributing to the test, we added that as a point. So total of potential seven points for our scale. So now we've listed here uh, our point system. So these were our counts for each of those, those genes. And so we had three that were um, a score of five. But remember, we could test up to five. We actually went above and beyond that a bit. So we've also added PDE4. Here you can see PDE12 here is associated with four different traits. 
PAX1 and GPT1 were the genes that we've tested. So one, two, three, four, five, six, we, we went up by one gene um, above what we thought we could do. Now this is work in progress. So I'm not going to show you, in fact, I'll probably skip through all of the results I was going to present. Anna, we're supposed to finish at 4.30? Uh, yeah, we can have questions after 4.30. Okay. So these are the reasons we picked these genes, apart from our scoring method, um, in defense of our scoring method. So FATP6, or also known as SLC27A6, had high cardiomyocyte expression was strongly expressed in the heart and localized to cardiomyocytes, because you know heart tissue is made up of more than just cardiomyocytes. It's made up of all the fibrous tissue that, and sarcomere um, that surrounds it. And it's predominantly the fatty acid transporter in the heart. So the heart, when it's healthy, unlike the brain that utilizes glucose, the heart utilizes fat as its metabolic type. So, um, that protein, FATP6, is that predominant fatty acid transporter. PD12 had moderate expression in the cardiomyocytes. It's a mitochondrial gene uh, and involved in poly-AD adenylation. Then we had this gene, which was expressed moderately in the cardiomyocytes, but we had loss of function variants in that gene, and it's likely to be involved in protein and glycosylation. HEX1 had very high expression in our cardiomyocytes um, and inhibits apoptosis or cell death in cardiomyocytes. MyRIP may act as a scaffolding protein. Um, we had loss of function variants in that gene and rare variants have been associated also with hypertension. And then finally, GPT1 is also another thing that acts as a scaffolding um, protein it's upregulated in hypertrophy, um, and rare variants also have been linked to hypertrophy. So those are our six genes, and we've done two rounds of experiments. So the goal in the IPSCs, and I'll show you exactly how we're doing this, is we're looking for differences in a known marker by knocking down the IPSC. So using CRISPR technology, we go in and we cut out the gene and the cardiomyocytes. And we look at normal versus the knockdown iPSCs. We also look at differences in the gene expression um, in the normal versus the hypertrophy model iPSC. So how do you hypertrophy cardi cardiomyocytes? You give them drugs like isoprenorinol as one such drug. So this is actually what we actually, I don't actually do this, but I lab colleagues do this. So this um, stimulant, isoproterenol, these are the cardiomyocytes. Um, this is the relative cell size hypertrophied after the isoproterenol is added and the control group. And I wish I had the actual video of this, but it doesn't upload very well. When they grow these cardiomyocytes, they start aggregating together and within about two days they start beating in unison. It is the most coolest thing to, to witness happening. But they take each of these cells and they, on a computer screen, and they draw around it, calculate the cell surface area. And that's the hypertrophy model. So we're doing a lot of ingenuity analysis, and I'm going to skip through this. Um, we found some really interesting associations, particularly with, with um, PDE, that gene, one of the PDE12s. And we're seeing lots of um, this means a pre predicted inhibition of lots of downstream mechanisms within PDE um, that are very exciting. Um, the fatty acid transporter, um, it's being uh, upregulated up here and several other proteins being downregulated by that. We are, we're very excited about that one. And then MyRIP is this really interesting one I've already said we had loss of function variants in this gene, and somehow we believe from our ingenuity pathway analysis that MIRIP is very closely interrelated with something called MPPA and MPPB. These are two major proteins that happen in heart failure. Um, so I won't go through the heart failure. So 
MIRIP is one of our top priorities at the moment. Um, and then finally, the fatty acid gene also appears to be upregulating and downregulating um, many different uh, elements related to fatty acid transport. So I'm sorry I couldn't show you more of these, but my basic science colleague who's done all of this intensive work with CRISPR and, and cell sorting and counting all those um, cell sizes um, isn't ready yet for prime time. So overall, I feel like I've gone through a lot of history of LV hypertrophy, probably more than any of you ever wanted to know, but it still remains my favorite phenotype. It is um, a very important disease, particularly for African Americans who have uh, the highest rates of hypertensive heart disease in the world. And much of that burden is due to hypertension, but there are some unique factors that appear to be um, cardiomyocyte specific. We still have a lot of questions that remain about the pathophysiology of LVH. Um, we know from our own heritability studies that genes play a role, and from our linkage and association and now exome work especially in African Americans. Modern statistical approaches for gene-based association, functional annotations and real expression data, um, and existing literature have, can be used to facilitate gene selection. I can't tell you how big the problem is of going from 30,000 genes to five. You know, you have to think through um, that carefully. Um, we succeeded in finding new human hypertrophy candidates that we hope will shed light on unknown pathophysiology um, and future follow-up is, is now ongoing. One of the unique things we're just now adding, if our IRB and at UAB ever approves it, is we're going back and doing national death index searches to look for long-term outcomes and causes of death um, because they were 49 years old in 1994 through 98. So now we think we'll have a sizable mortality and we can really like understand the genetics of harder outcomes in this really unique population. So Anna, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm happy to take questions.